I'm Todd Hopley, and today in the studio I go one-on-one -on -one with Tom Devine, partner at Kaplan Kirsch and Rockwell, an aviation lawyer uh, specializing in airport uh, business for decades. Uh, we go back a long time. Absolutely. Thank you very much for being in the studio. Sure, my pleasure. Uh, you wrote an article recently that appeared in Translaw mm -hmm. that talked about the federal regulatory regime um, impacting airports, and I thought it was a provocative, thoughtful piece and wanted to have you come in and talk a little bit about it. You talk about how grant assurances are one of the primary mechanisms by which the federal government regulates airports, and you make the argument that they've grown over time from initially being a, a fairly small number of grant assurances that made sense into a much larger universe of grant assurances, some of which you question whether they really make sense. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, it's not just the, the number, it's the expansion and the interpretation and the scope of the specific grant assurances. For instance, there's a grant assurance uh, uh, prohibiting airports from unjustly discriminating against aeronautical users. That sounds like motherhood and apple pie. Who wants to unjustly discriminate or allow that? But then the way it gets interpreted, it, it turns out that if an airport has a vacant piece of land on the airport, and an aeronautical service provider wants to use that land, the FAA says you have to negotiate with them in good faith for that land, even if you may have five other aeronautical service providers on the airport providing that same exact service. So it seems to me that it interferes with basic landlord-tenant rights. Um, I don't think anybody disputes the fact that FAA has a role in regulating the safety of airports or even perhaps in regulating the efficiency. You don't want somebody putting up a cell tower uh, you know, that'll interfere either electronically or with the uh, ability of air aircraft to land safely at an airport. But um, short of things like that, why should the FAA tell you how you can use your airport property and manage your uh, landlord-tenant relations? Uh, particularly with property that you may, this airport sponsor may have bought and paid for itself without federal aid and without a donation from the federal government. In the article, you talk about how there are several dozen three dozen or so of these grant assurances, and you kind of put them into buckets, mm -hmm. uh, bucket of ones that make sense and you don't propose to tinker with much, and then another bucket of grant assurances where you make the argument they aren't really necessary. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about those two elements and how you would, if you were magically king of the world, how you would change the current regulatory regime. Well, interestingly, FAA is the one that originally put these into buckets. They had a proposal several years ago to reclassify some of the grant assurances, well, actually all the grant assurances, into three different categories. Two of them would be grant certifications or um, grant conditions, which related directly to the project for which the grant was given, uh, how you do a construction project, how you do the procurement, whatever, things like that. And about half of them uh, have nothing to do with the project itself. It's just, okay, we're giving you money, now we can you know, get our hooks into you and regulate something that you're doing over here that has nothing to do with the project. So um, I think you, you can't just say, okay, that half makes no sense, but I think it's worth taking a look and see whether it actually does make sense. Uh, and, and part of the concern that I have is even taking a step further back, is you, you know, the idea is the federal government gives you money, it attaches strings to it as the government always does, and that's the price you pay. You have to live with it, that's the deal. Well, if you take a further step back, you realize that airports inherently and constitutionally, according to the Supreme Court, have the right to charge air travelers a fee for traveling through the airport. The, uh, the uh, constitutional standard is very broad and gives airports a lot of discretion. Congress came along and uh, basically prohibited airports from levying direct or indirect charges on the air travelers, and then said, on the other hand, well, we'll tax those same air travelers, and we'll give you some of the money, and by the way, because of our largesse and giving you some of the money, we're gonna put all these strings on. So when you take a look from that perspective, it seems even odder. All right, I want you to expand on something that you wrote. I'm gonna put it up on the screen here. It is reasonable to ask whether the acceptance of AIP dollars should dictate how an airport carries out a project or control how an airport conducts its operations, development, land use management, and tenant relations that have nothing to do with the project, or whether federal regulation of airport construction should be more proportionate to the federal contribution. You sort of talked a little bit about that mm -hmm. uh, earlier. 
Give me a little more on that. Well, there's, there's two issues there. One is uh, the, the federal requirements that relate to the project itself, and then the other is the, the extraneous regulations. So for the ones that relate to the project, I've heard the FAA say, well, yeah, it's true that maybe in a particular airport, AFP only contributes 10, 15, 20 percent of the total capital needs of the airport, or even a particular project. Um, but they say that might be the critical part that gets the project uh, off the ground. That may be true, 15 percent maybe, but the 85 percent was equally critical, if not more so, because it's larger. I mean, if the FAA contribution was the only contribution, the project wouldn't get off the ground either. So then you have to say, okay, the airport sponsor is contributing a lot for the project. Why does the FAA all of a sudden get to control everything because it puts in a certain amount? Uh, you know, is this the tail wagging the dog? And then with respect to the other half of the uh, assurances, the ones that relate to airport tenant relations, uh, basically, you know, how you have to deal with uh, the tenants. And, and, you know, the trouble is I get to see the dysfunctional relationships. I deal with compliance issues. I deal with people who file Part 16 cases against airports. And so I see, in essence, how private interests use the federal grant assurances just to promote their own parochial interests. The FAA says, and Congress said, okay, these are valuable public interests, but at the end of the day, it's really used to advance private gain. Well, and that's a great lead into the next one uh, quote I want to put up on the screen uh, from the article. You wrote, it is reasonable for airport proprietors to wonder why they do not have the right to determine the appropriate use of their own property based on airport objectives and market conditions. Right. I mean, it seems unusual, again, for the federal government to stray beyond safety and efficiency. Nobody's saying the federal government can't regulate the safety of airports. They could do that under the regular authority power. Uh, they don't have to do it by grant assurances. Um, but to then go in and say, okay, uh, we think that, uh, you know, somebody who wants to be an aeronautical user should determine the mix of uses. I mean, what developer, what landlord says, okay, I'm going to let the prospective tenant decide what uses I should make of the product. What should be the mix of stores at the mall? What should be the mix of offices in an office park or in, in industrial uses in an industrial park? Uh, and it just seems peculiar for the federal government to step in and say, no, you know, unless you have an approved ALP that specifically has another use designated for that spot, if it's a vacant spot and Eric or your user comes along, you've got to negotiate with them in good faith for that spot. And it's the airport director in the airport that has the responsibility for looking out into the future and determining what the best use of that is at their facility, or at least it certainly should be, rather than you know, an individual private entity that doesn't have that long-range view and has a more self-interested view. Well, you and I know from over the years of dealing with not only airlines but other aeronautical users, yes, they have typically a short-term perspective. Now, in some instances, you may have somebody who wants to make a long-term investment because they realize, okay, this is going to make me a ton of money. Well, maybe the airport says, that's fine, but maybe we would like to structure it a different way. So uh, whether it's long-term or short-term, I think the key issue is who controls? Is it the tenant or is it the landlord? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, cut to the chase, end of the article. You lay out a series of uh, possible solutions, if you will, to this issue. And we're dealing now in an environment of diminishing federal resources. Um, talk a little bit about what you propose. Well, one of the reasons this is, I think it's timely, even though, as we discussed before coming on air, there have been proposals uh, dating back 30 years uh, in terms of what's the appropriate federal regulatory role with respect to the, um, the, the grant funding of, of airports. I think one of the things that would be good to do is to actually just take a step back, not say, okay, Part of the problem is these grant assurances get built and interpretations get built upon each other, and pretty soon at the end of the day, you're left with the mystery, the uh, Winchester Mystery House. Okay, it's a mansion that sort of is interesting, but it, you just take a step back and it makes no sense. So instead of saying, okay, this is the way it is, say, how actually should airports rationally be regulated by the federal government, and what rights uh, and powers should airports retain? I mean, I'm obviously a big proponent of airports proprietors' rights, but I think it's fine to take a look at, you know, with all parties and just say, okay, what really makes sense here and why is this here? And yes, this grant assurance may say, okay, you can't unjustly discriminate, but does that mean, or you have to have, you know, your airport has to be open to all types, kinds of 
aeronautical uses. Well, maybe every airport, it doesn't make sense for every airport to have every type of aeronautical use at it. Maybe it makes sense for some airports to have a niche or cater to a particular market and not have some of these extraneous aeronautical uses. All right. So you talk about limiting grant assurance to safety, security, uh, system efficiency. And those things that actually relate to the project for which the funds are given. Sure. And then uh, argue that the FAA ought to use the regular regulatory process, notice and comment, uh, utilization of cost-benefit analysis, those, those pieces rather than just sort of regulating through grant assurance. Right. It's become a convenient way to regulate. I mean, you remember when the competition plans came out, it was because the DOT tried to regulate um, airline predatory pricing, and the airlines beat it back. And then they look around and said, okay, what's a convenient place to regulate. Oh, let's make the airports do a competition plan. I mean, airports weren't engaging in predatory practices. Um, airports can play a role in enhancing competition, and by and large, airports certainly want to do that. Uh, but airports uh, haven't been the problem. All right, Tom, that's the time we have for today. For those of you interested in reading Tom's article, we've included a link to the article in uh, the email announcing this uh, video. So take a look at that. Thank you, Tom, for joining us in the studio.